Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Pasi Ikonen. I come from the Faculty of Education and Psychology, University of Jyväskylä. I will be hosting this seminar today. Uh, the topic of the webinar is contemporary research on digital education in, in Finland and in India. And this is a, a joint effort uh, between Chindal India and the Nordic Center in India. Chindal comes from Global Innovation Network for Teaching and Learning India. It's a funded by the Minister of Education and Culture of Finland. It's a network uh, in which Finnish higher education institutions, together with partners from India, co-create research-based solutions to global educational challenges and collaborate in research and education. Kintal India also seeks opportunities to facilitate staff and student mobility initiatives between Finland and India. The Nordic Center in India uh, is a consortium of leading universities and research institutions uh, from all Nordic countries, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. And it facilitates and supports a wide range of collaborative study and research activities in higher ed education in India and in Nordic countries. As I said, the topic of today's webinar is contemporary research on digital education in Finland and in India. And we have a pleasure to have two excellent uh, keynote speakers, uh, one from India, one from Finland, who have uh, a long career uh, of research and, and development projects uh, of this topic. And I'm delighted to uh, call our first uh, speaker, Dr. Pia Nanki. Dr. Pia Nanki is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education and Psychology in the University of Jyväskylä. Her research group is specialized on questions of technology-enhanced learning environments, and she has a solid background in self-regulated and collaborative learning research teacher education and teacher-student interaction and emotional skills in digital learning environments. Professor Nauke has published uh, extensively uh, and, she has, and she has led and, and currently led uh, several research projects funded uh, by Minister of Culture and Education, Academy of Finland, and European Union and other major stakeholders. So her research covers various approaches related to our webinar topic today. Uh, welcome, Professor Pia, and, and you can continue. Hello, everybody. I'm thank you for your presentation, Pasi. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invitation for the Jindal Network. And and uh, good afternoon, every every colleague in, in different countries and different towns and municipalities who are now following this webinar. So uh, in my talk, I will talk about learning and interaction in digital learning environments. And... Um, And, in, and before I begin, I just shortly uh, give an overview of this talk and, and uh, position myself in this very broad field. So I look at these questions of digital education from the learning science perspective and as a teacher educator. So I'm interested uh, how people learn and how we could support them uh, learning better. So these two aspects of understanding how learning occurs and then, then pedagogical and technological aspects of how we could 
how we could uh, design different kind of learning environments and pedagogical settings to provide them support in their in their individual learning needs. And my main theoretical frameworks, what which I have been implementing in my in my earlier research, are self-regulated learning and collaborative learning. So, aiming to understand the strategic learning processes quite thoroughly to understand the cognitive processes, but also the emotional and socio-emotional processes within learning. And in this talk, I will just shortly, not, the, not to review the current situation, that is too ambition, ambitious for the small talk like this, but more like pointing out a couple of uh, current points. Uh, what is the digital learning situation in Finland? And I will provide some examples uh, from a teacher education context. Uh, we studied uh, Finnish student teachers' experiences uh, during the pandemic time. So uh, pointing out a couple of points from that study and then providing an, an empirical example of where we used uh, virtual reality as a, as a learning environment and focused especially on the topics of socio-emotional presence uh, of group members while while learning in this environment. So the main starting point is to understand active minds and, and, and to understand learning as a very complex interaction between cognition, motivation, emotion and metacognition. So learner needs different skills, skills to organize information, to memory systems, to uh, to remember the information and the motivation to learn and motivation to uh, regulate own motivation in learning. So in times of different learning challenges to, to have a resilience to continue in, in own learning processes. And metacognition to view overall like what are own learning skills and how to provide better support for, for own learning. And nowadays learning happens more and more in different social settings, in groups, in interaction. We are working and we are learning together with other people. And so it's important to understand the social contexts and, and different type of technological affordances, what we are using for our own and for our shared learning processes. So a framework of collaborative learning uh, is focused on both the face-to-face -face interactions, but also the online learning interactions. And the collaborative learning research has recognized that there are some temporal and multidimensional characteristics that are in the optimal cases shared between the part partners in, in collaboration. So collaborative learning research has uh, recognized, for example, planning and monitoring and evaluating as a very important strategic processes within, within social learning contexts. So people need to uh, share their understanding and negotiate uh, of their task understanding, like how they understand the task, what they are supposed to do together, how they understand the content they are working with, uh, how they share the task interests, and group expectations. So uh, both kind of uh, cognitive aspects, but also motivational aspects, like how interested they are in the task and uh, how they support each others to be better focused in the task while working together. But of course, it's not always very easy. It's very strategic process and there might be uh, different type of challenges in, in groups. And in my previous research uh, with colleagues, we have, we have uh, used video observation research to understand uh, the social emotional interaction within groups. And we have recognized that there might be some even very strong emotional reactions that may challenge the effective group interactions. And uh, we have also recognized that when these emotional challenges are occurring, the group members may try to continue the task working, but they are not necessarily solving the emotional challenges. And, the, and that means that the uh, different type of challenges continue uh, and are repeated uh, while working. 
But we have also recognized that these emotion regulation strategies uh, can be occurring in group level and group members in a in a very good situations they might uh, even be able to regulate each other's emotional experiences and emotional expression so they engage in meta level discussions on the on the how uh, emotional reactions are occurring and they aim to solve those as a as a uh, shared process and we have also aimed to uh, provide some uh, uh, support for, for developing these important strategic learning skills. And we have designed this uh, modeling and practicing uh, scenarios where uh, teacher students could practice uh, emotional regulation in authentic situations. But when we discuss about the learning and interaction in digital learning environments, those important uh, group level strategies are even more important when you don't necessarily meet face to face and you don't share the same space and you are relying on, on uh, rather limited information that you can, you can receive while working in true online systems, for example. So uh, in terms of the digital learning in, in Finland, uh, teachers in, in Finnish schools, they use different forms of digital learning materials and resources in their teaching practice. And it's a very essential part of the core Finnish national curriculum, which describes uh, seven transversal competencies. And one of those is the ICT competence. So in Finland, we see the ICT uh, or digital learning as an as a object in learning, but also we see it as a tool for learning. So uh, people need skills in digital environments and, and nowadays when the digital tools are actually everywhere, uh, people need skills to, to function in, in those type of in environments but also because the digital environment can be a tool for learning. So it can, can provide that type of environment where you can, uh, you can do uh, things that wouldn't be possible without digital tools. So kind of understanding how, how it can, can be a support for, for learning also. But currently uh, one big challenge one could say is that the polarization uh, between digitally expert teachers and teachers with very limited digital skills or very limited uh, interest towards uh, digital learning and digital education. So uh, this may create uh, uh, challenges for unequal learning opportunities for children and youth. So even though that it, it has been recognized as, a, as a one of the main transversal competencies and seen as a, as a kind of like future skill, uh, we are currently in the situation where, the, uh, where the, there might, we might be creating some unequal learning opportunities because we are not able to, to provide system that would cover uh, cover it so that every children in every school would have the possibilities of, of uh, developing these skills, of practicing these skills and practicing the meaningful use of uh, digital uh, technologies in, in their schools. So we have, we recognize that this digital transformation is currently putting a lot of burden also on teachers. So there are a lot of comp competencies needed and, and to gain those digital skills that they are not currently systematically thought during the pre-service training. There are some basic skills, of course, but the pedagogical aspects and the, and the way of implementing those meaningfully as a support for, for, for example, collaborative learning, it, there are things to be, to be improved. So there are both, there are opportunities, but there are challenges what digital transformation of the education sector is bringing to, to us. 
And of course, uh, representing a teacher educator, this means that uh, we are in a very critical position to, to provide these skills and competencies for our our student teachers so that they would be more able to bring those to the to the school systems and to be kind of the leading persons to to provide the the equal possibilities for for children and youth so as everywhere the the covid-19 pandemic uh, it it was a challenge but uh, it can be also looked as an opportunity, how many schools and educational institutions were uh, kind of requested to rethink how the education is administered and organized and how the instruction is provided now after the post pandemic times. Uh, different reports, for example, OECD report has, has highlighting the struggle but also the resilience of many education systems worldwide, that uh, the education systems were able to set up strategies and continue to provide access to education in spite of the many difficulties that, that were faced during the pandemic time. But there are some very severe uh, results of the pandemic uh, or the disruption uh, for the education system. So what, what uh, for example, students have, have faced. So the report, reports are very worrying, but they are showing that the students face social emotional distress. Um, they, uh, they were incapacity to engage consistently with the education, uh, disparity in access to technology, uh, unequal skills to engage with technology and also uh, unequal uh, ways of how parents could be guiding uh, or supporting while, while homeschooling environment. And there are currently very uh, big uh, research projects worldwide and, and this is one example from um, our uh, our project that is uh, Strategic Research Council and Academy of Finland is, is uh, funding, so EduRescue project, and the, that's a collaborative project between three universities. Uh, University of Jyväskylä and Maria Kristina Lerkanen uh, is leading that project. And uh, from University of Helsinki there, Katarina Salmela Aro, and uh, from University of Turku, Maria Vauras and their big research groups are tackling the issue of, of uh, COVID-19 pandemics and other, other crises what we are currently facing. So what is the resilience of the school system and of the, of the different levels of school systems from the, from the pre-primary to, to teacher education systems? Like how, how, what we can learn from this crisis to be more resilient uh, during the next crisis. So there are a lot of ongoing research and already published research in terms of the EduRescue project. And the, uh, the focus has been on different participants, for example, coping mechanisms of the students, teachers and school principals, but also the parents and guardians uh, possibilities to support children and youth well-being and learning. And we are joining in to this uh, big project from the teacher students and teacher educators per perspective and looking the type of challenges, uh, what they experienced, for example, creating and facilitating interaction and social presence during the COVID time, emergency online teaching. So a couple of examples from how the Finnish student teachers experienced the COVID emergency online teaching. And we collected the data from the second year teacher education students who, who were actually the students who were uh, studying all of their university studies in COVID time. So they had experience only from the, from the online teaching or the some moments of when we were back to, back to normal, normal uh, uh, campus 
teaching. So we collected the questionnaire uh, from their challenges, what challenges they experienced. And they, uh, they, uh, we uh, saw that they experienced social challenges, challenges in self-regulated learning and physical challenges and challenges to relate it to online teaching arrangement. And when we look at this in more details, we uh, saw that the social challenges were uh, the biggest part of the type of the challenge that they experienced. And they experienced, for example, loneliness, not being able to meet and to be in the same space than the other students. And they felt lack of interaction and social presence during the online teaching. And they felt lack of informal connections during the, during the teaching. Uh, we also recognize some self-regulated learning challenges. So students uh, reported that they had challenges to focus on online teaching and they had challenges to create their own study rhythm and keeping up the interest. And they had in overall some challenges in differentiating the study and the leisure time because everything happened in the one, one location in the home environment. Uh, also, online teaching affected and 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 uh, they experienced some uh, uh, physical challenges because of having long term and continuous computer work and they lacked the daily exercises. And some uh, students also reported dysfunctional or unpleasant teaching arrangements. So here are a couple of examples of each type of the challenge. So. Uh, some students say that the loneliness was a challenge because all of the time as in university students has been online and they have therefore she or he have not been able to create friendships. Uh, Self-regulated type of uh, challenge in terms of concentration and active participation. So uh, some students uh, reported that the active participation and presence in, in Zoom environment takes much more energy and uh, online teaching thus makes you more passive and there are more challenges in concentration. And physical challenges in terms of sitting at the computer for long periods of time affects physical well-being. Uh, in terms of teaching arrangement, one example is that uh, when there is no face-to-face -face teaching, the number of written assignments has swelled to an unreasonable large number in some courses. But we were also interested to, to hear if they recognized some resources, uh, having some resources during this COVID online teaching. And the students recognized that uh, they were planning their own learning. Uh, they recognized resources in terms of physical elements and leisure time and social elements and well-functional online teaching. So they are both sides. So uh, when asking about their resources, the students reported that they were creating own rhythm and selecting a suitable study place. And they were, some of them were enjoying peace, safety and flexibility of their own home environment. In terms of social resources, they were reporting that they were actively engaging to group activities. So they were missing it, so they uh, aimed to actively engage uh, through online systems. And they received uh, support from family and friends. Uh, students reported that they also took care of having enough exercises and outdoor activities and sleep, rest and healthy lifestyle in general was recognized as a resource. And also well-functional online teaching was, was also recognized. So some students reported that flexibility in doing the learning tasks in own space and time, and that the video materials of the lectures uh, were, they were able to go back to the materials as many times they wanted and when they had time for it. Uh, students reported that the group activities were very important and those supported and that they supported each other and worked together. Um, 
And then uh, some students also reported that they have cut down the digital time of in the digital environments in the leisure time and remember to enjoy also outdoor activities. And then some students recognize that the interaction within the teaching makes them more actively engaged and also keeping the cameras on when they are discussing uh, supports them to participate more actively. So in, gen in general level, we, uh, we pointed out that students missed the social interaction and they seeked possibilities to, to have the social interaction even during the online online teaching and this is part of what we are aiming to do in 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 our research group so we are especially interested on on how groups and individuals in groups could be supported to engage in and productively collaborate in different technology enhanced learning environments so recognizing the pedagogical and technological affordances that these technology enhanced learning environments could provide for learning and interaction. And in the last part of the, the presentation, I will uh, provide a case example of, of one of the ongoing studies, what we are now, now doing. So uh, using the virtual reality as a learning environment uh, for environmental storytelling and, and focusing on socio-emotional presence of group members. So this uh, was a part of the interdisciplinary learning model in, in University of Uvascular Teacher Education. And this uh, case implemented together with our teacher educators and with two different research projects. And, the, and in this uh, course, we address teachers' core competence areas. So uh, competencies related to interaction and diversity, social and societal competence and pedagogical competence. And the theme of, of this course was uh, sustainability and climate education and we provided the experiential and art and trauma based teaching methods and, uh, and use the and the aim to use different learning environments to support and, and to provide new ideas for both the teacher students, but also to teach educators of how this course could be organized in, in part of the virtual reality. So we used Allspace VR and ThingLink as, as a new environment for both the students and for the teachers. And uh, as a, uh, research project, uh, we provided uh, pop-up meetings uh, both for the students and for the teachers uh, before, the, before the actual virtual trauma activities so that they could uh, get more used to, to working in these uh, learning environments. And we had the idea of implementing virtual trauma to this uh, course and we uh, instructed students and, and divided them to five groups and they were representing different types of media personnel. So they were TikTokers, YouTubers, bloggers, vloggers or radio personnel or magazines personals. So uh, they this was kind of part of these drama activities that they were taking this uh, creating their own avatars representing the assigned media type. And the media type was because they were asked and instructed to think how they could affect on their followers' uh, environmental thinking. So as a preliminary task, we asked them to install the Altspace VR and create uh, their own account and then familiarize themselves with an environment and our UXR campus. So our space where we have the UXR island uh, where people can go around and, and it's designed to be kind of like creative space for diff different type of group activities. So there are different locations within the island where you can 
you can move around and gather together to discuss. In this experiment, we didn't use VR headsets because we were in the remote, uh, remote uh, and restricted uh, pandemic time. So uh, students didn't have their own headsets. Instead, they were using the 2D version from their own computers. And uh, we divided the its media team their own working spot on the island, so they knew where they would go uh, in the island. And we asked them to save the outcomes of their working on their own kind of desks on, on ThingLink environment. And as a backup environment, we had a gather down. So if, if some group would have had some technical problems, we could then take the backup environment to, to be in use. And we collected the data of, of video data, screen capture of the uh, groups working. And then we collected also the student reflections in, in Webproport. And in this study, we are implementing the framework of communities of inquiry, which is quite uh, well known and uh, widely used framework in online teaching. So, and the digital pedagogical development, focusing on different uh, parts of, of, of experiences of presence. And in this study, we are at the moment focusing on this social presence. So how students are interacting and collaborating in the virtual world. The other aspects in this uh, framework are uh, cognitive presence, uh, how they are dividing or sharing, sharing the information and building knowledge, teaching presence, what kind of teaching arrangements there are to support the students' work, uh, learner presence, how they are organizing their work, sharing work and managing the time, and technical presence uh, would be the affordances of the virtual world, and emotional presence would be emotions and, and feelings awaked by working in the virtual world. But at the moment, we have been looking at this social presence. And uh, we have been looking at it from the video data and recognize the, the elements and indicators and examples. So uh, how interactive, how cohesive and how effective uh, the interaction has been. And we are currently working on, on this uh, video analysis to to uh, write a first conference paper on it. I'm looking my time and I, I see that I'm a little bit running out of the time, so I need to a little bit speed up now. So, uh, and we uh, also uh, uh, collected their experiences and, and students uh, were reporting that this idea could be useful for teaching and it would be more easier to jump into virtual character than in the face-to-face -face activities. And then some students felt that this increased their uh, kind of like uh, feelings of self-efficacy in terms of technical new applications. So kind of uh, developing also digital pedagogical skills while as a student using, using this type of environment. There were some challenges uh, because we were using the uh, 2D version, so there were no uh, read, uh, facial expressions that could be read. And the students also recognized that they kind of felt it a little bit challenging to talk out of turn. And, and because there was uh, the little time between the interaction that, that normally wouldn't have been taking. And uh, they felt like when they were providing the presentation of the of their media team, uh, they saw that the people were gathered around them, and uh, they were watching like they would be in a normal normal situation. So this could be the way to practice talking in front of the group. And the student also experienced that trauma activities help them to step into a role, and they they. We're taking the position as an expert 
and actively thinking about how and why the character acts in a certain way. So in that way, this gives an uh, yeah, kind of like uh, idea for us the, that this uh, trauma activity uh, was useful and and provided kind of immersive experience that they felt like being as a as a media expert uh, in this task. So we had some technical challenges. We had some sound quality challenges, lack of expression and little time. But we also saw some benefits. So it was suitable for trauma activities and it provided uh, a task to also learn teamwork skills and enable them to self-express in a new way and also a possibility to develop digital pedagogical skills and experience of self-efficacy in terms of use of technology. And they also, some of the students saw it as a tool that they could be using in their own teaching and potential for relieving a stage fright also. And we are uh, continuing this and in the next uh, phase in a new uh, course, we will be implementing this again. And, and now we are implementing it uh, with the head mouth set. So actual virtual reality experience will be provided for the, for the students and we will provide them more moving around in virtual world uh, and not only to stay in their allocated spaces. And then continuing also with the video-based reflections and teacher educators reflections. So as a conclusion, a couple of main points. So what we are aiming for is the meaningful use of technology as a support for learning and interaction and to provide experiences both for the teacher educators and student teachers about how technology could be used as a support for learning. And we aim to understand the skills needed to learn and interact in digital learning environment. And because then during the COVID times, teacher students and teacher educators miss this social interaction and feeling of social presence. That is something we need to design better and design more to, to our teaching. And also to, uh, to provide new possibilities from virtual reality technologies to provide support for, for learning and interaction. And, and now it's my time to thank you for your attention. And if, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Pia. <clears throat> uh, couple of questions. We have time for a couple of questions. So, uh, first of all, you, you mentioned about the, the reality or risk of polarization between amongst the teachers, their uh, pedagogical skills or technical skills uh, in digital uh, environments. Uh, how about, uh, how do you know how big this risk of polarization uh, is amongst the students? Like, Years back, we, we, we'd like to talk about digital natives, how all students are capable and competent using uh, all digital tools and environments. But do we know how competent uh, the students, primary or secondary level students are with, with those tools and, and environments? Yes, I think uh, uh, like young Young people, youth are more and more capable overall with the different technological tools. But what I'm thinking is that uh, their like basic skills and, and the meaningful use of, of uh, tools for learning and interaction, they, they might be very capable in, in terms of the kind of like a social use of or leisure time use of, of technology. But to, to use them uh, as, a, as a supporting them own, own learning and kind of like cognitive activities, that is something that uh, they may need support from the teachers. I know that the one very current topic is also the uh, digital media use, kind of like we are talking, talking more and more like how often 
and how long times people are using uh, digital medias, kind of like uh, relaxing and just uh, spending time. Um, but what I'm thinking that those skills to use it uh, for the cognitive activities, that is not like self-evidently developing, but uh, children need support for that. And then maybe also this uh, one topic is that uh, how each others are the, the behavior and kind of like there are some uh, some some like a worrying worrying speech also about uh, how how social media affects like how you are behaving towards each other so that type of skills also kind of like socio-emotional understanding of others feelings and and kind of like like being uh, politely using those those tools and environments thank you <clears throat> one more question uh, you describe how during the pandemic uh, teacher students uh, some of them they were able to keep, keep their social connections and, and, and active uh, uh, lifestyle and also they were able to regulate their, their, their learning and studies and well of course some students didn't have those also those capabilities do you know or do you think that those students were the same uh, when all went digital a combated situation before pandemic or after pandemic because we know that the university students in general um, some students are more capable to regulate their learning and 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 daily life and the social skills. Some are lonely also outside the mm. pandemic. Do you know, are there different or same students? Mm. Yes, I, I think this social aspect and, and how pandemic affected or made it more visible. Uh, I think that is something that needs to be considered and studied further. Like uh, uh, how I know that there are some uh, like large studies that are indicating that that this was uh, the general direction was uh, towards social isolation. Uh, but was it so that the, the social isolation was there already, but it just made it more more visible and we are now talking more about it. But uh, what I found uh, important and interesting was that the, uh, how students, when they recognize that this is important for them, these social connections, so they gain more aware of it. And maybe they became also, some of them at least, became aware of it, how they can, they can themselves try to uh, develop those resources and to, to engage others in different ways. So I think it's important to point these out and uh, to provide examples that if if we are going back to different crises and, and we are more more aware then like from the beginning like the system has developed from how it was uh, earlier so kind of like uh, providing information of this topic so that we would be more aware and and to be more aware of uh, trying to find resources and provide resources to, to each others. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pia, for your presentation and your, your answers to these questions. Uh, I think it's time for us to go to the next, uh, our next guest and a presenter, Dr. Amina Taraniya. She is an associate professor at the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. She is one of the founding members of Connected Learning Initiative at uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and currently she is leading technology field action project called Delta 21st. She led a large-scale teacher professional development, which was awarded by UNESCO Teacher Effectiveness uh, 2020. 
She and her team has extended this initiative across nine states and five different languages in India. Over the years, she has published and presented her research and practice internationally, providing evidence-based advocacy of teacher agency and learners as producers and not merely consumers of ICT research. So, warmly welcome Professor Amina and, and let's all enjoy your presentation. I'm so sorry. Uh, I was on mute. So sorry. So I, um, yeah. Uh, sorry for that. I had uh, forgotten to uh, unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to share and present my presentation today. Um, I would like to present uh, from our practice and research uh, certain learnings that uh, I have been able to call features mostly secondary schools in India, uh, which are run by government, and therefore looking at a very marginalized context of the Indian society, and typically uh, either it's rural or it's urban ghettos. Uh, some of the innovative use of technology, um, if we look at the literature uh, over many, many years, some of the characteristics of this innovative use of technology um, that we come across are when technology is used, uh, considering learner's context, is it's learner-centric, connected to curriculum, uh, allows agency or autonomy for the learners and the teachers, um, allows learners to not only consume the resources that are made for them by others, but also allow them to create their own learning through artifacts, through projects, through problem-based learning research, and create with their own and take technology in their own hands to create their knowledge. Um, also, uh, technology, when it really fosters uh, collaboration across settings across geographies, across age groups, across languages. Um, and uh, very importantly, uh, technology is not used or advocated or designed to replace teachers, but it takes teachers along in their design, in their implementation. Um, and it also facilitates teachers to and give them an opportunity and freedom to innovate. Um, also, some literature which talks about uh, use of multiple uh, uh, devices and technologies. Coming to National Education Policy of India, which uh, got released in 2020, also emphasizes a lot for the first time on integrating technology into teaching and learning in K-12 as well as uh, higher education. And maybe for the first time, it's talking about technology improving teaching and learning and in pedagogy and curriculum. It is, it's no longer looking at technology as an added subject only, but integrated within subjects. So that was a very welcome move. 
and uh, leveraging harnessing uh, technology for continuous professional development this was also a uh, very uh, welcoming and a new move and extensive use of technologies for emerging technologies like ai machine learning in order to use it for scaling intervention scaling learning and also assessments uh, but what was also important to notice in this national education policy was that uh, mostly there was a lot of emphasis on content creation and uh, disseminating this and making this content accessible and this also this policy kind of uh, uh, also was released in the pandemic and so there was a lot of emphasis also on giving access to digital content and resources and it seems that learners themselves uh, having the autonomy agency to create their own content and learning through that was kind of missing uh, from uh, the approach of uh, uh, technology use in the national education policy so in this presentation um, i'm going to use uh to illustrate some of the innovative use of technologies by using the context of one large project uh which is uh, i'm calling problem uh, project based learning with uh, technology or in those days we also use project based learning with icit uh for adolescents in uh, some of the uh, rural uh, context in india so so this in nutshell kind of summarizes that intervention it was uh, uh, it was focusing on connecting technology with the curriculum allowing students to go deeper into their curricular subjects by creating projects and at the same time capacitating teachers to then accommodate and integrate this project based learning with technology within their subject lesson plans through professional development for teachers and uh, uh, the outcomes which also evolved over time in this 10 years was looking at learners as confident producers and adapters not just adopters but adapters of technology imbibing 21st century skills and have confidence responsibility accountability and agency to adapt and tinker with technology to also disseminate in their communities um and this was largely the the rural project uh, 91% for rural wherever urban settings were used it was mostly uh, uh, either muslim ghettos or other minority ghettos uh, you know of uh, marginalized communities now reflecting back on uh, you know how in this 10 years uh, you know how this entire initiative moved from phase 0 to phase 1 and what was the changing role of technology that facilitated or got facilitated by these changes uh, so very importantly the first stage uh, was not a scale model it was just seeding and understanding if this project based learning with technology uh, with the curriculum in the year 2012 in india in very very rural settings where it was a very novel concept usually your uh, technology was only seen as like a, a you know learning computer sometimes a textbook on how to use computer not even practical or even if students are taken to the laboratory they are only learning uh, digital uh, uh, technologies computers certain applications but this was a little novel in 2012 because this required students to create with technology and go deeper and connect with curriculum and 21st century skills so when we started in phase 0 it was uh, mostly we started with learning centers in informal learning centers uh, which were run by non government organizations uh, and it was a very controlled setting and it was very easy to do this kind of um, innovation the scale was not too much considering india 
as a large country and the stakeholders and the teachers were mostly ngo facilitators and uh, when we trained the teachers it was also face to face workshop doing very very rigorous uh, uh, supervision of the field work and then giving them extra revision workshops it was kind of very rigorous on ground when we were kind of push to for scale and move into a government uh, or public school system and handling that kind of a scale that's where it was required for technology also to be more sophisticated uh, to use more distance technologies and uh, um, that's where we started uh, concentrating on school teachers to use it because that would be scalable and also sustainable and so how do you basically train so many teachers in indian schools and uh, that's where we introduced use of blended and distance technologies uh, using moodle to start with and then move to a more sophisticated uh, um, uh, learning management system um, this the scale kind of was huge you know 390000 students and this was possible because we were able to concentrate and focus on capacitating school teachers in the government systems and giving them uh, and even professionalizing the workshop no more giving them workshop going field to field but converting this capacity building into certificate courses and uh, putting this intervention into academic setting and then the teachers who took the courses from us in the blended they would actually come for face to face workshops but also they would go back practice what they learned about project based learning with ict the learning theories the 21st century skills practice with their students and come back on a learning management system and then reflect on what they practiced so here practice also became part of the capacity building and reflecting on it it was no more like one of the workshop so that became kind of a scaling uh, a mantra or scaling strategy uh, to disseminate this kind of an approach over large geography uh, these are some examples of when students create what it looks like very simple examples we ha we had in phase 0 where students would use spreadsheet um, measure their own body mass index understand what is body mass index and then make nutrition plans or make small videos and um, uh, for example also uh, measuring rain uh, making rain gauge measuring and then creating a rain gauge for their classroom doing very authentic measurement of rain comparing across cities using internet and then putting a project together slowly when we moved uh, maybe in 2016 17 we also introduced coding and computational thinking other applications which also kind of led the technology to be more sophisticated and that also gave confidence in students to then adapt and tinker with technology change it and you know go more deeper into Of what they were making uh, connected to their context. Now, this I would not call phase three, but uh, when the COVID started, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the schools uh, were actually struggling to even conduct their own classrooms uh, and uh, in online mode. and so it was a huge challenge for us that uh, even the regular classrooms were a challenge and of course it picked up later on but how do we do project based learning uh, with technology in now in an online mode so it was a huge challenge slowly we kind of introduced uh, and built on the concept of web quests which is very old so with the project based learning we added the component of problem based learning or i would call inquiry based learning and here we invited students who were already with us uh, through whatsapp groups uh, at the time of pre covid also your teachers who were with us uh, uh, in the pre covid period we leveraged on this community of practice groups 
and they invited students to come online and uh, at this time uh, 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 the entire intervention looked very different uh, because now the students from all states stay eight states would come and they would speak very different languages and they were used to doing project based learning with technology only in face to face environments so they knew how to use these technologies but they did not have experience of doing project based learning with technology in an online mode and they did not have their teachers with them so they had huge challenge uh, but they were still i think a fraction uh, we were not able to this, do this at scale but we were able to do with a relatively small scale with a couple of hundred students maybe about 700 students who were able to come online and we kind of changed our intervention and converted it into an inquiry based learning so for example um, we stayed with the connection with curriculum we had teachers with us who uh, designed with the TIS team and we would pick up the topic, create a problem around it, and uh, introduce these problems to students over uh, online, give them some two to three days uh, to experiment, to use these concepts uh, in their real life, find solution, and come back on the uh, synchronous uh, video conference. We were using uh, 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 an application. We were using Zoom, uh, and they would come back and they would also basically do a lot of homework assignments and you know so there was a lot of rigor uh, in this inquiry based learning which required students to also do projects uh, now online and what was very very uh, encouraging was that certain things that we were not able to very uh, to use it uh, in face-to-face -face project based learning with technology, we were able to do this in an online mode in this leap quest. Uh, for example, uh, since a lot of other states were there, uh, our, uh, our problem or inquiry based learning would actually include things like, like comparison of, uh, for example, a project on air quality index would require students to compare their air with other states, with other cities, with rural, with, and then they would bring their findings and they would argue and challenge each other from different states. So it really brought all this, not eight states, but at least four state students to come together and uh, speak kind of a similar language uh, uh, because they were all familiar with this pedagogy. And then we would also divide them on Zoom in different uh, groups based on their languages where they, their teachers would be there and that would be like a safe, comfortable zone for them to speak their language and then come back to the main room and then connect with others. Also bringing other uh, professionals uh, internationally, uh, nationally. So I think it kind of gave that kind of an opportunity in this online mode to bring people from outside, bring scientists, bring doctors, uh, you know, bring other uh, students in international universities. So it, the, the collaboration kind of became very, very rich. Um, uh, we also realized that, uh, you know, flipping classrooms or flipping this leap, leap quest between synchronous and asynchronous was very comfortable with the students. It also uh, did not require them to be on screen all the time, but they would experiment, work on projects, and then come back, you know. So that kind of flipping also was uh, very, very useful. Uh, about the leap quest and uh, the intervention that I was talking about, in one of the research that we have been able to document, uh, uh, we went back and interviewed uh, some of the students who uh, who did leap quest and at least completed two leap quests and did uh, submit their projects we asked them uh, you know how come this happened and you were able to come online and do project based learning and collaborate with others what really facilitated and uh, i think that is what we were expecting that your prior experience 
of uh, uh, pedago of the pedagogy of using project based learning with technology getting comfortable with basic technologies uh, getting comfortable with presenting their projects in their own classrooms actually helps them to make this transition of doing this in an online in a more confident and competent way and that's what they mostly reported uh, some of the students also said that the in depth research that they were doing in the pre covid period that kind of also gave them confidence so actually for them it was only the mode uh, of uh, project based learning or the communication mode had changed but for them the pedagogy was very familiar so that smooth transition for them uh, was real Uh, uh, as the time went on, um, also, um, yeah. So some of these findings say that, and um, yeah, and now they also said that our teachers always help them. But in this online mode, when our teachers sent us more help on WhatsApp and asked us to join, that also gave us familiarity, and we could see our teachers also on this leap quest. so that also made them feel very comfortable in this online mode and uh, uh, since only a fraction of this entire uh, population were able to we also asked them that why other colleagues did not join why you were the only ones who joined and majority of the students said that uh, it's that basically the infrastructure the internet connectivity with other students so, so these were really the fortunate ones who had some basic connectivity or they had access to their teachers who were who were also helping them with basic infrastructure and connectivity um this is also contingent uh, this is also uh, similar uh, to some of the earlier findings that uh, uh, going in depth and you know allowing students to construct create uh, and go through uh, this knowledge deepening allows them to even use that learning in a different context and that transitioning and transferring is easier and possible if the intervention allows them for some kind of a knowledge deepening and constructing their own uh, learning um yeah of course this sample was very very small uh, for this interview so but uh, uh, but it it, it is quite uh, encouraging to find these findings as well um now what we realized was in uh, covid 19 2021 uh, we got an opportunity with the other delta project uh, uh, to uh, basically use same project context so this context was mumbai and we never worked in mumbai uh, Uh, context and urban context and working at one of the ghettos a very large ghetto a slum area in uh, mumbai and working closely with schools but we started in an uh, in the covid period where the classes were uh, the regular classes were already running in an online mode so when we tried to get into those online classes of the teachers and we tried to do project based learning with technology it completely failed and some of the reasons were uh, you know the, the the children were not familiar with that kind of a pedagogy not only in online mode but they were not familiar with project based learning with technology and connecting with curriculum even in the face to face environment so there was no familiarity and uh, the way they were taking the classes the regular classes from their teachers was very very small period like 2 hours in a day and the teachers would usually give them a lecture on zoom and then put some homework assignments on whatsapp so this kind of a pedagogy that we used in leap quest they were not familiar with so their expectation or even uh, expecting something like so rigorous in an online mode they were not familiar with and it completely failed um then what happened is uh, uh, slowly the a uh, lockdown period kind of 
uh, you know, uh, it kind of came to a face to face and it again went into lockdown and then again into face to face. Now, when it came into face to face, we kind of captured on that uh, opportunity and we started doing very rigorous camps in the schools. In this camps, uh, we introduced project based learning with technology in a face to face environment. And this time we particularly gave them a lot of experience with distance technologies. So, uh, uh, you know, use uh, Zoom or any other uh, video conferencing tool and whatever you made in this camp, now share it with other school, even if it's like two kilometers away from that school, uh, but still uh, uh, share what you have done or share it with other teachers. Uh, through video conferencing. So giving them that kind of uh, hand holding in case if it goes again in a lockdown, then they would get familiar. And I think that kind of worked well. Uh, you know, we didn't go where for the very long period again in the lockdown, but they got used to using this kind of uh, uh, pedagogy also uh, in the uh, online mode. Now uh, I'll move from uh, I hope I'm in time. I'll move a little bit now into um, the teacher professional development, uh, which is uh, woven in into this entire initiative with students. Uh, so the teacher professional development, uh, 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 you know, was a very long, had a very long trajectory. Uh, it started with face-to-face uh, uh, -face workshops for NGO facilitators. And then when we started uh, doing capacity building with government teachers, because we started putting the intervention in government schools, uh, then we, uh, we uh, actually started certificate courses on constructivist use of technology and put the, the practice component. Uh, then this blended mode gave us very, very good teachers who passed this course. Uh, did face to face workshop, did practice in the distance mode and came back reflected. And we made them like mentors for other teachers. And then they went and then they trained other teachers. And that's how we got scale. So this entire trajectory uh, and when the COVID period started, uh, these teachers who uh, actually took the certificate course became mentors. They also helped us doing a very large online, just not blended, but online teacher professional development in their states. Uh, to very large number of teachers. So, you know, that kind of uh, trajectory it had. So, the phases of this continuous professional development went from face to face workshop to blended. And then in phase three, when we were asked by UNICEF to uh, do 4,000 teachers online learning in the COVID period and uh, do it totally online to mostly uh, rural teachers, we used all our experience in blended mode in face to face and we created kind of a eight weeks course, a six weeks course, which they finish in eight weeks uh, in a totally online mode. And this pedagogy kind of continued, but it took a different shape. So, for example, when we moved teacher professional development uh, in an online mode, uh, it was very difficult to do, uh, to grade their reflections, to grade their lesson plans, and we introduced them uh, peer assessments. So we used a learning management system which allowed large scale peer assessments, and we were very skeptical in the start to do this. Uh, but I think uh, teachers slowly, even, uh, uh, even if they did not know much of technology, they slowly kind of got used to this peer assessment. And uh, then they really appreciated that, uh, you know, they were trusted to even give feedback to their peers. Uh, and uh, how did they grow with others' feedback and how they really felt trusted and they felt honored to give feedback to others. So that kind of worked in the long run. We also introduced uh, in the COVID period a digital badge because we realized an online certificate course, uh, many teachers were uh, taking it, but uh, a few uh, kind of a section of teachers 
uh, wanted to complete things in two weeks. They did not have much time. So, you know, we kind of chunked our course into smaller bites and then we gave them badges instead of certificates, which had uh, less academic kind of credential, but uh, we uh, included state government logos, the funder logo, and uh, disseminated that, you know. So that was a little bit of innovation. We did that uh, to bring this. Uh, and uh, the, the COP kind of, the WhatsApp and the Telegram groups that we're using were actually very, very helpful, uh, you know, that kind of sustained teachers' interest and gave them tremendous learning support. So I'm going to skip this uh, uh, study. Uh, it basically uh, goes back to the earlier study, but with teachers. And what this study actually um, re-emphasized was that if teachers have gone through this kind of a pedagogy, uh, then they are, uh, and they have done a certificate course in the past before the COVID period, and they have disseminated and become master trainers and mentors, then they were more likely to use project-based learning with technology with their students in the COVID period. Uh, so we have some statistical kind of evidence to prove that kind of transference of a very rigorous CP CPD uh, that emphasizes constructivist pedagogies uh, and then teachers' competence and confidence to use it in the COVID period, uh, we have some statistical uh, uh, kind of evidence to prove that transference effect. Yeah. I'll just, uh, this was the course that uh, uh, with objective, with uh, some of the objectives that, you know, give them a perspective of constructivist uh, teaching and learning and then give them practice in an online mode. Uh, I'll just very quickly, what really helped in this a very large uh, TPD, uh, CPD and this course, I think uh, very rigorous support. So I think uh, online, C I mean, a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, when we move trainings into online mode, it's easier. And uh, I think we have a lot of data to say it's really very rigorous, it's not easy, and it really requires very in-depth planning and designing and uh, implementation strategies. Uh, so online COPs, online class, every day, one hour online help for teachers. And some of these teachers would ask very, very basic questions on how to log in on the learning management system, how to basically pose a question, how to hold my phone, how do I read, I do not have time, I don't have a laptop, can I read this on the phone? And I think this tremendous vigorous learning support is what made at least 60% of the teachers complete these courses. Um, the practice component, uh, you know, which allowed them to not only understand this concept and read articles and take multiple choice questions, but also design the project based learning with ICT and implement in their classroom and then post their reflections and get graded for that uh, reflection uh, that practice component with the learning management system allowed was very, very useful. Um, and also this flexible accreditation, some teachers were okay with digital badges and completing in four weeks. Some teachers went for very rigorous eight weeks and got certificate. Giving them that kind of a choice and freedom, I think also kind of motivated teachers to stay back and complete the courses and then sustain those practices in their classroom. Very importantly, I think in this uh, courses, uh, it did not stop on learning something and implementing in their classrooms. Uh, even with this large uh, certificate courses, we invited teachers in step two. And that is, now you have learned, now you have implemented, now you are confident. Now go and basically train other teachers and you'll get a badge as a master trainer for that. So I think giving them that kind of a leadership and uh, a, a 
kind of a freedom to train or create their own community of practice groups with your teacher friends or in their district in their state they really like that opportunity because it was really trusting them to take leadership role and a lot of teachers in the interview said that they really honor you know and they look forward for that kind of a leadership role uh in fact uh, in some of the interviews uh, we also found that uh, the teachers said that you, you know when i was helping other teachers i was able to help better than the university teams because i could speak their language uh even uh, you know their tribal language sometimes or a very specific language and whatever uh, challenges i went through i was able to better empathize and uh, this mentor said that teachers also felt very comfortable calling us at any time and asking us questions so i think that mentoring uh, making that layer of mentoring was very very uh, useful acknowledging in their peer groups uh, after completing the course giving them certificates uh, and uh, you know at the state platforms at the university graduation platforms all these were the strategies which were very very uh, uh, kind of but still uh, completion rates are still not uh, uh, very good but i think um, something like this doing in an online environment with government teachers especially those who may not for many this was their first uh, uh, opportunity to do an online course was something uh, which was very very unique um and i think in future with more research and reflection we also need to see how do we improve this kind of a teacher professional development for higher completion rates shareability is something that uh, we did very little bit of data on it uh, which says that teachers were thrilled to share their digital badges on whatsapp facebook sharing with headmaster sharing with with uh, other colleagues sharing it with their parents putting it on their facebook and uh, also they became ambassadors of taking this kind of a courses is what uh, uh, comes out from the survey uh, reports as well one thing that the teachers mentors specially said in the interviews was that uh, we have done this and we are very motivated and the state has also supported but now that we have gone through so much of processes uh we really look forward for state to give us recognition as mentors but right now the state systems do not have this kind of a systemic integration of giving them recognition or continue this and continue to leverage on this mentors as leaders in the state it's kind of done more informally but it's not systemic and for something to sustain at a large level this kind of a systemic integration is very very important so uh, i think i'll just uh, stop kind of your uh, just reflecting uh, that you know technologies uh, using multiple technologies uh, and uh, this is really work in progress for us uh, this kind of a framework and this multiple technologies leading to certain pedagogies or these pedagogies that's why we have not put the heads of the arrow or this pedagogy is actually facilitating or inviting or pushing us into the direction of finding this innovative technologies for larger outcomes which looks at scalability shareability collaboration transferability adaptability and better and seamless communication and collaboration So, so this is something that we are right now looking at uh, more data consolidating and doing kind of a more me meta analysis of our experiences and data to come up with this kind of a framework which is work in progress um yeah and some of uh, some of the very uh, in depth case studies of what i have been uh, just highlighting in the rural areas and using project based learning technology is also captured in this book that just got published this year which has like 32 authors from uh, different states from different teachers from ngo partners from state uh, so just for your reference and i'll stop here thank you so much
thank you, Professor Amina, for this very interesting and profound presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, of course, it's very uh, obvious that we are talking about very different uh, scale when we talk about Finland and India. Um, when we talk about number of teachers or students, or even states and languages. Uh, 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 do you know, uh, does there, is there any, any plans on national level to provide schools or school teachers with digital devices like computers or pads? Because I think there's a big variety of the uh, between the states and individual schools at the moment in India when it just comes to the hardware in a way. So are there kind of national level plans or state level plans to provide schools with hardware? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. Actually, the national education policy is not talking much about it, but it's emphasizing more on personal devices or, you know, so earlier the focus was more on the lab structure, like every school having computers and desktops. But in this 2020, there is not much emphasis on that, but it's more on flexible devices, handheld devices. Uh, and in this COVID period or even after that, I think it's more state specific. Uh, their policies, uh, you know, uh, certain states have actually given laptops uh, to, uh, to students who are meritocratic or give laptops to the teachers, uh, provide smartphones or, you know, create some kind of a community hubs in the villages where, uh, you know, or the teacher training what we call diets and put this infrastructure there and then let people use it. You know, so I think it's not so much centralized, but every state is working on a different kind of policy and guidelines. Yeah, but yes. definitely uh, in that direction. In fact, India uh, in the COVID period, the national um, the national intervention started with very large scale uh, digital resources were disseminated. Keeping in mind that the access devices will be mostly phones and internet connection. So I think more emphasis was more towards that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Another question. Uh, you mentioned these, these batches that uh, teachers could get uh, while working as a mentor teachers. Uh, do they, uh, those teachers, uh, do they benefit uh, also financially while they are working as a mentor teacher or master teacher? No, it's uh, purely voluntary uh, for them. So I think it, it's a little complicated it's not definitely financial in any ways uh, for many teachers some of the states said that we will keep it voluntary whoever wants to sign up for the course they will sign and still we got very high number of teachers who signed up although they did not complete and in certain states they actually issued letters and asking those teachers to enroll so there's a dynamics you know if someone asking you to enroll and sometimes you just do volume so that is an interesting piece of data that we are waiting to analyze but no financial uh, no financial increments or anything but what we are asking the state slowly and we are advocating that if they have done so much of teacher professional development they have become leaders they have become mentors allow this into their career pathways you know a system which kind of give them some credits towards moving towards a career pathway. At least that will be very, very uh, encouraging for teachers. This sounds very interesting. We have uh, in Finland and in Europe some kind of uh, similarities. We talk about micro credentials, but mm -hmm. uh, especially in India where the number of teachers is so high, this, this Sounds very, very interesting. Uh, sure. Especially uh, having had a chance to visit India, also the rural schools, yes. like two months ago uh, in the state of Uttarakhand, where the, and able to see the facilities of rural schools. This, this sounds also, 
you mentioned also that the role of NGOs. Mm -hmm. Could you describe a little bit how this relationship with, with NGOs and, and the states work when it comes to teacher in service trade? Right. So I think our earlier phase were more NGO because we were in learning centers and that kind of gave us proof of concept. Uh, you know, it was a very controlled environment. Um, you know, it's more like do innovations the way you want because these were supplementary or learning centers that, which were run by NGOs. So we spent a lot of uh, energy uh, in training NGO facilitators to do it. When we moved into schools, we did oh. not let the NGOs go away. But this NGOs actually were invited to do certificate courses with the government teachers. So mm -hmm. kind of we clubbed both together. And I think that was very, very beneficial because uh, say as a university, we were not able to be always on ground. But this NGOs facilitators would work very collaboratively with the teachers on ground. And they were both trained with experience and certificate course. So that was very useful. When we moved into phase three and uh, it was just us doing online learning with this 4,000 teachers, there was no scope of NGOs. So we leveraged on government teachers whom we had trained for so many years and they become they became kind of uh, mentors over this five years helping us with translations helping up as you know so ngo was very beneficial but in this phase three large scale somewhere it was not possible the funding had ended and the new funding kind of required only us doing implementation so we leveraged on the teacher mentors that we had created earlier. So it's very complex, but yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Because, well, we have NGOs also in Finland, but it's still the, the dynamics is a little bit different, uh, especially when it comes to when we try to duplicate uh, a model of in-service training, for example, that the, the number of teachers is so much smaller in Finland, so it's easier. Yeah. Thank you for your answers. Thank, Thank you me. for your presentation. Uh, Thank you for all the audience. Uh, it's time to close this webinar. I wish you have all a uh, nice week ahead of you. In Finland, it's getting dark and, and, and cold, but it's still, it, it was very nice to meet you all. Thank you.